Today we're going to be checking out this low-cost, off-grid sine wave power inverter. I know many people are limited as to how much money they can spend, so when I come across something that looks good for the price, I'm definitely going to test it out. As usual, if I see anything I don't like, you're going to hear about it. Links to this product have been placed in the video description area. Now in a previous video, I tested another sine wave inverter and it was made by Reliable. It was a 3000 watt inverter. Now over here, you can see it says 4000 watts. And I'd be willing to bet that it's not 4000 watts continuous, but 4000 watts peak, which is very misleading if that's the case. Over here, you can see it's a 12 volt unit highlighted in red. It's available in 24, 48, or 60. The most popular are the 12 and the 24. The output for this inverter is available in 110 volts or 220 volts. The cost of the inverter in my other video that was a 3000 watt rated unit was around 280 to 300 bucks. This unit right here is only $140 shipped. So a big difference in price but we need to see what the maximum continuous rating is for this unit. And I have a suspicion because many of these are worded just like you see here, which is deceptive, but the rating is typically half of that amount. So I'm expecting to see a 2000 watt continuous rating. And if it performs well, it is definitely going to be worth 135 bucks. The other inverter made by Reliable that had the 3000 watt rating powered almost everything in my house, the refrigerator, microwave oven, but it had a problem supplying enough inrush current to a chop saw. Hopefully this one here with the higher surge capacity can easily start up that saw. So we're going to find out. If it does, that's gonna be pretty impressive for such a small unit. And it's only about two and a half inches thick or maybe 60 millimeters. So if you wanted to mount this inside of a truck, it would be ideal. Construction for this unit is an aluminum housing, or if you're British, aluminum. On the rear side of the inverter, you can see that there's two cooling fans. And right over here, let me hold this so it doesn't flop down. You have the connections for your battery cables. And these appear to be about 10 millimeters long. I would have liked to have seen these just a little bit longer because the time you put your connector on there and you go to tighten it down, it's not going to leave you too much room, but I think it will be enough as long as the ring connector is not too fat. On this side, you can see the MOSFETs are bolted to the extruded aluminum housing to dissipate the heat. And the same on the opposite side. The bottom of the unit, nothing special. On the front of the unit, you can see AC out. You have one receptacle. This unit, when I power it up, you're going to see that unlike the reliable inverter that I showed you in the other video, which did not have a bar meter display for the state of charge for the battery, this one does, and you'll see it light up. It'll be green at the top, red at the bottom. It's also going to display DC voltage, your AC output voltage. Unlike the reliable brand inverter, it did not show you what the output wattage was. This one shows you the AC output wattage, and you can see it says mode one and mode two. According to this manufacturer as well, they tell you that you're able to short the AC output and the unit will not be destroyed. Now, I checked not only the reliable brand, but I checked another one that said you could do it, and both broke. So I'm not a big fan of shorting the AC output on these units. There's really no reason for you to be shorting that output. What I suggest you would do is pick up a circuit breaker like you see right over here, a push button type, and connect it in series with the output for the receptacle. You can drill a hole in the unit and have the reset button on top. In this case, if this happens to be, which I'm not sure yet, a 2000 watt continuous unit, then you'd wanna use a 20 amp push button circuit breaker. So if the output is shorted, it's going to save your MOSFETs from blowing up and blowing all the fuses inside this unit. So that's the smart way to do it. I'm not going to be shorting this to test it because I'm not going to end up with three burned out units just to try shorting this when you don't have to short it. This unit also has, like all the other inverters, a high temperature cutoff. If the MOSFETs get too hot with the heat sink, it's going to turn off the unit. Now connected up and I have the power supply unit set for 12.7 volts. 
Just like a fully charged lead acid battery, I'm going to push the button to turn this on. And you can see the voltage building. And now we have our full output. You can see the battery right here, it's showing fully charged. And over here you can see with the unit not connected to anything, just the power, all the internal circuitry for this inverter along with that digital display, we are drawing around 450 milliamps. Now if I push this button right here, that's AC wattage, DC volts, 12.7. AC output. If I push and hold, now it's going to cycle all by itself. And you can see it does it at a very good rate, not too fast. So now I'm going to go back to the original, just push this once and I'm going to push it again. I want to go to the voltage right there. I'm going to connect up just a small load, something that draws maybe around 40 or 50 watts. So let me plug in a soldering iron and I'm going to slowly lower the voltage to see at which point this starts to indicate that the voltage is too low and at what point this is going to turn off power to the receptacle. And now we're going to plug it in. You can see the current is almost 4 amps, and the output is fine, 35 watts, 12.3. The voltage you see here, 12.3, is a little lower than this because it's being measured off of the back of the unit, not off of the back of this unit here. And we do have this 2 foot length of wire. So let me gradually lower the voltage and see at what point this shuts off. Three. Okay, so at 10.2, it starts beeping. Output voltage still going, 35 watts, that's good. Oh, there we go, it's gone. Gone. All right, yeah, it's trying to build and it won't do it. Cut off 9.4. All right, so now you know the level around 9.4, it's done. Now let's take a look at the high voltage cutoff. Maybe 15 and a half around 15 and a quarter to 15.3 volts. Let's lower it back one notch. Let me see it. Oh, there it goes. I was just going to say we might have to reset it, but nope. So the voltage is, yeah, 14. So when you get back under 15, it comes back. Okay, so that's pretty good. The low cutoff and the high works. Let me open this up so we can take a look at the inside. And here's a look with the cover off. I'll turn it around in a minute so you can have the view looking this way. But what I want to do first is get an idea of the actual continuous current output for this unit. And to do that, I want to take a look at where the fuses are. And they're right over here. You can see they're 40 amps each. And like many other inverters, they're all placed in parallel. We have six of those 40 amp fuses. So 6 times 40 is 240 amps. When using a power inverter, you take 12 volts DC to boost it up to that 110 range. And it takes approximately 90 amps of DC input current for every 1,000 watts of AC output. So we have 240 here. So that would be roughly 2,400 watts. Now, I don't think they're going to push this to the 2,400. So Looking at this right here, more than likely this is a 2000 watt continuous power output inverter and then you have the surge capacity up to 4000. Now over here you can see they have three of these wires. It looks like number eight, three number eight wires. They're all connected in parallel and the wires are extremely short and a lot of the inverter manufacturers do that. It's a lot easier than putting one big heavy gauge wire, it's harder to bend, so they just put a bunch of these in parallel. This over here looks fine. The ring connector has pretty good thickness. I would have liked to have seen just a little thicker. 
This red wire over here goes to the temperature sensor, which is located right there. We're going to check that in a minute. I'm going to hook up the power, put on the soldering iron, and place my heat gun right against the side out here, just to make sure that this does work if this gets too hot. Now there's no sensor on this side, and that's telling me that this is more than likely the side that gets hotter than that side. So if this side gets too hot, you know that this side here is probably going to be slightly cooler. This is the inverter drive board, very similar to the one in my other inverter that I blew up, which was the Reliable brand 3000 watt. I was unable to get the exact same board, so that's why it's remaining a paperweight. Over here is the circuitry for the low voltage cutoff, high voltage cutoff, probably the temperature sensor, as well as over current. Let me flip this around so you can look the opposite direction. With the unit turned around, you can see the diodes as well as the other MOSFETs and that temperature sensor right there. And this inductor probably limits inrush into the load that you have connected to this receptacle. From this angle right here, you can see the back of the display board as well as the receptacle. Now there's two things that I see here that I want to address. The first thing, you notice that there is no wire connected to the ground pin of that receptacle. And it's not the first time I've seen that. If you're going to be using just a polarized plug, it's not going to make a difference. And of course, if you plug in a grounded plug, you'll be able to plug it in, but the ground is not going to be connected to the device you're using. There's a simple way around that, and there is a pin installed here, so you would just have to solder a wire onto that, maybe a 16 gauge. And when you solder to that point on the receptacle where the ground pin is, you'd want to get maybe a ring connector and put it between right here and the cover. You want to scrape that really good so you have shiny aluminum. Do the same on the cover. You're going to connect it to the cover. And then if you're going to be using this for off-grid power, you would want to place this in your area where your batteries are, possibly in a garage or a shed. And you want to also take that ground location and connect it to earth ground. So you'd want to find maybe a cold water pipe, copper or galvanized. You could place a clamp on it and run maybe a 16 gauge wire over to this unit so it's grounded. If you do not have metal pipes and only PVC, then you're gonna to need to pick up a ground rod. They're very inexpensive, maybe 10 bucks. Drive it into the ground, put a clamp on it, and run your wire over to the cover. You should be good to go after doing that. Now the wire right here, you can see, looks a little thin to be carrying the current for a 2000 watt load continuously. And I think, yes it is, it's a number 18. Number 18 really can only handle about 10 or 12 amps. And when you get higher than that, you're going to have too much resistance in that wire. And the wire is going to begin to heat up. If you decide to make this a little thicker, which is probably a good idea, I would go with number 14. Just swap out the green wire from the board to here, the green wire from the board to this point, and then you would have 14 gauge stranded copper going directly to the receptacle. You want to change this out as well because it goes from the board to the receptacle. The soldering iron is now connected back up. You can see we have 116 volts going to the soldering iron and the power supply is showing right around 4.2 amps. So let me take the heat gun. I'm going to apply heat right on that heat sink to see if the alarm comes on and turns off the power. Cooling fan just came on, both of them, there you go, overheated, very good, so that works and the power is off, very good. In case you're wondering if the output is pure sine wave, you can see right over here on the oscilloscope, the sine wave waveform, right over here, 15.6 volts. And this is showing 16.3. Also included with the inverter is this positive and negative cable to connect to your battery. It is a little lighter than I'd like to see, but it should work okay. You have two extra fuses, 40 amp. And over here, you get these battery post connectors. I'm not too thrilled with how small the area is right in here, even though it's good thickness. It 
just don't like it. I don't know if I'd use those connectors. Okay, let's take this outside and see what it can do. We are all set up outside. I have my 4D brand new Marine RV battery fully charged, connected up to the inverter. Over there is the chop saw that the reliable brand 3000 watt inverter was unable to start. So we're going to test it out to see if we can start that one up. In the other video, this worm drive circular saw was able to start and the heat gun. Okay, you can see right there it says 116 volts. It's on mode two, it's cycling and 12.8 volts. Here we go. So no problem running the saw. Okay, let's repeat the test using the saw first, and then I'm going to add in the heat gun to see how much power we can get. And it couldn't make it above 1600 watts. Let's see if it's because the voltage is dropping too low. Wow. 11.3 and it turned everything off and we weren't even near 1600 watts. I was hoping it was going to be 2000, but 2000 is not looking too good. It has no problem doing this though. Yeah, as soon as it gets over 1500, it stops. All right, let me see if it could even start that saw, because that would be impressive that it's able to handle the surge, but the rating for this for continuous is going to be less than 2000. It's going to be probably around 1500, which we're going to have to investigate. Okay, let's see if it could handle the surge on the chop saw. Now that is impressive because the other unit could not do that and it was a 3000 watt unit. This one is much lower in wattage for continuous power output, yet it can start this right up. Okay guys, what I want to do is repeat the test using my lithium iron phosphate battery that I made. And the reason why I want to do that, as a lithium iron phosphate battery drains or discharges, the voltage remains fairly stable, unlike a lead acid battery, and I'd like to see if it's cutting off because the 11.3 is the low voltage cutoff, or if that's just an overload for the unit. So now I have this battery connected, it's going to have plenty of voltage, let me repeat the test, and hopefully we can get 2000 watts out of this unit. Let me turn on the saw first, and then the heat gun. No good. It looks like it hit around maybe 1750 or 1800 watts. Let me repeat the test. This time we're going to look at the voltage to see how it acts when the unit clicks off. And as you just saw, the voltage was nowhere near that 11.3. So this is actually disconnecting power to the receptacle and we're not even up to 1800 watts. So that's not a good sign. So now I'm gonna use the hair dryer and we're gonna hopefully adjust the speeds to see what the maximum output is for this unit, okay? Not good, guys. That's it, not good. This is very hot on the side. Very hot. Yeah, this is very hot. Maybe you'll get 1,000 watts continuous out of this unit with a high surge capability. And I'm not too sure if a pure sine wave inverter that's a 1,000 watt with a high surge capability is worth 135 bucks. It's up to you to decide. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to rate, thumbs up, share, and check out my extensive video playlist for many other videos of interest to you. Thanks for watching.